But Tibbs, like, okay, so he, when he works with Derrick Rose, youngest MVP, Derrick Rose was awesome. Oh, he was. I've never heard that before. Have you talked about that before? When, when this year, Jalen Brunson, I mean, before Jalen Brunson got hurt, every single game he was scoring 40. He just is great with these point guards, but he's also mm-hmm. just great with all these dudes in the backcourt, whether it's like John Lucas the third to Dante DiVincenzo. John Lucas But the I third, also yeah. feel like Tibbs, especially in the playoffs, this. and a lot of this is because he runs his guys into the ground because they play a lot of minutes. I feel like every Tibbs team, other than the Boston team where he was the assistant to Doc, has been the same team in the playoffs when you think about it, right? Like yeah. the Bulls had their little run one year, really, where they were healthy, and they run into the heat. Right. And you just didn't have another shot creator other than Derrick Rose. You had Luel Deng, Carlos Boozer, Joe Kim Noah, nice players, but nobody that could create mm-hmm. their own shot, nobody that could really shoot the basketball. That's kind of like this Knicks team, and also... Other than that team, you had a bunch of injuries. You had a team where Nate Robinson had to go off and be your leading scorer. And Did Joe he have like Noah, 50 in a playoff yeah, game once? Against yeah. the Nets. Joe Kim Noah was like your point guard a year oh, where he yeah. finished top five, top four in MVP voting, mm-hmm. and then the Knicks, your Knicks gave him all that money. No, but, no, no. Phil Jackson gave him the money. This Worst is, front office guy ever. But it's crazy because every Tibbs run always ends up the same. A beat-up-ass roster where you're relying on guys who are nice players but are like fourth or fifth options, you know, trying to be option number one on a playoff team. As Carolina now scores again, I knew I should have just bet Carolina. It would have been a sweat because they trailed this entire game one nothing. But I could have even... Uh, 13 to go in the third. Plenty of time still. These. Thir- I know now i got to sweat out the damn total, though, because yep. we'll pull a goalie here yeah. soon. 2-1. Hopefully no more scoring See, that's what, the See, that's way. what kills you in the playoffs, yeah. especially, yeah. is goalies getting pulled earlier. And that's when totals, when unders specifically, go to die. Can't have another goal. If it goes 3-1, I have to, uh, I have to cry on the air tonight. It's feel free. It's okay. Three one is when we get when it gets uh, crazy here. That's that's when that's when around like three minutes, two minutes. Yeah, that's that's when it all goes to hell. We pull the goalie, and then it's always like this meaningless goal with usually always. about forty eight seconds always. to go. Not even with like three minutes to go, and it just comes and punches you you're, right in the stomach. You're, see, this is why in a, what, in a harmful way. You know what? What what is more frustrating to bet on right now? Is it self? Again, I just want to take Caleb Williams out because it's like you know, taking sure. a team that won seven games last year. I feel like a lot of people are just going to kind of lean on the Bears first in the situation that Caleb Williams is in. So the rest of the, the quarterbacks that were taken in the first round, who do you look at and say they can have like an immediate impact at quarterback right away? Well, I mean, availability is going to be the first thing that you're going to want to look at out of the mm-hmm. box. And, you know, uh, Jane Daniels, I think a lot of things fall in his favor because there are skill position pieces around him. Um, that he'll be able to utilize. It's not like he's walking into a bare roster. Um, You know, when you look at Scary Terry, um, you look at uh, Jahan Dotson, Ben Sinnott, I think could have a chance to be a a very high-impact player out of the gate. The backfield has some depth and then ability uh, to catch the ball in the backfield. And I actually, oddly enough, as long as he doesn't get trucked, the offensive line not being great in a way I think – plays in his favor from the standpoint of looking at how productive can he be as a rookie quarterback he's going to have to run it's not going to be a situation where he's just going to you know navigate around the pocket and and be relied upon to not use um his legs as part of that offensive production the coaching staff has already said look we we expect that to be a component of his game out of the gate they just have to keep him healthy with the frame that that he ultimately has but i kind of look at him and i say Kyler Murray's rookie year, like an RG3 type of rookie year, where you see a high volume of running production as well as some passing production. Um, The overall versatility, I think, could have him putting up big numbers. Whereas like Drake May, I think realistically, there's a chance he may not start there uh, to begin the season. There's, there's, There's work to do. The surrounding pieces, you know, Jalen Polk uh, being obviously the rookie receiver that they took in the second round, um, Javon uh, Baker that they took. Um, you're, you're talking about players that I think in the long term can benefit him, um, but there's still skill position skill position pieces to sort out. And then you have a, a veteran quarterback there in Jacoby Brissett that I think their 
confident they can lean into at least in the early going with Drake May and bring him on, bring him along a little bit more slowly than Washington plans with Jaden Daniels. I saw you guys put out your latest mock draft, your mock draft for the 2024 NBA draft, and we had the lottery. So um, Atlanta gets the number one overall pick. You have <laughs> the Wizards at Jeez. two. You guys have Donovan Klingon going three to the Rockets. Just uh, your initial thought on what we saw with the lottery, you know, at least these top four teams and kind of, you know, what you see happening here early on in this draft. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. So this has been kind of considered a – like wing, bigger wing, heavy draft at the top between like Modest Bazelis, Ron Holland, Zachary Risa Shea, like Steph Castle even kind of fits into this mold a little bit. But I think that what we saw, and this is more useful for your audience probably, I think what we saw was a lottery order that will probably push the point guards up the board a little bit earlier than what we thought. Because you look at number two, the Wizards, they have a real need at point guard. Tyus Jones is a free agent. The Raptor or the Rockets at number three. They have Fred Van Vliet, but Fred Van Vliet can be a free agent after next season or the season after at the very least and isn't getting any younger. Plus, they have all of these younger dudes on their team already. The one position they don't really have a younger dude in is the point guard position. So they could easily look at a point guard. San Antonio obviously could look at a point guard at number four and number eight. So I, I look at the lottery order and my biggest takeaway was I wonder if this order pushes the point guards up the board a little bit more than what we expected early on. And then the other thing is just Atlanta getting the number one. I mean, that creates so many different potential avenues for them as an organization. They could look to try and rebuild this thing entirely. They could look to move Trey Young and try and build around a Alex R or whoever you want to build around. They could also decide that they want to try and make this thing work again you draft Alex Sar and you know maybe you move Clint Capella to get under the luxury tax and then you run this back with Trey Young DeJounte Murray DeAndre Hunter and Yeka Kongwu Alex Sar Bogdan Bogdanovich and try and make the playoffs like I don't think that's a good idea but it's not impossible right so the the number of avenues that were opened up for the Hawks I think is the thing that uh, beyond the point guards potentially getting moved up the board probably stood out to me most Oh, really quick, just who's your favorite prospect in this draft? Just because, like, when we talk about yeah. this, everybody's like, oh, you know, it's not the deepest draft. Oh, I don't really like this draft. Yeah. I want to want the lottery pick in this draft. Who would you say your favorite prospect is or, like, a guy that you think maybe could end up being an all-star? Because I don't know that there's many in this draft. Yeah, this draft compares most to 2013, where I believe there were three all-stars, Giannis, Victor Oladipo, and Rudy Gobert. Uh, that's... I believe about half as many as you would expect in a normal draft. Typically you get like five or six in a normal draft. I would say the guy that I like most is probably Alex Sar, but I don't know that I love him because he has the most all-star upside. I think that he's just a guy that if the offensive skill set comes together, has a chance to impact winning the most because he's an awesome rangy defender at the four position. Uh, if Steph Castle learns to shoot, and I'm skeptical on this. Like, he shot 26% from three. There are a lot of reasons to be worried about Steph's shot. I think it looks mechanically okay, but it's going to take some time at least. If he learns to shoot, I think he probably does have the highest upside in this class of anybody because he's a great defender. He can really, really pass the ball, which we saw at lower levels throughout his AAU career. And he's a winner. Like, we saw him be a huge part of a winning organization with Connecticut this year. So uh, I have Steph Castle at number two on my board, and he's probably the one that I would say, if he learns to shoot, you can see real significant all-star outcomes.